Good morning. My name is Kim Motes, and I'm the program manager of the Performance Plus program. And on behalf of the Kennedy Center, I'd like to welcome you to our Mary Lou William Women in Jazz Festival panels. This panel is called The Business of Jazz, The Importance of Mentoring. We have a, a very distinguished panel with us this morning that I'd like to introduce. Uh, to my left is Melba Liston, who is our Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz awardee this year and she is long known for her being a trombonist and a ranger. Next. Yeah. Next to her is Marion Hayden, who is a musician with Straight Ahead and is part of the International Association of Jazz Educators Sisters in Jazz program. Next to her is Dr. Billy Taylor. Absolutely. Next to her is Dr. Billy Taylor, who really needs no introduction. Um, he is the Kennedy Center's artistic advisor on jazz and a jazz musician. <laughs> Next to him is Maria Schneider, who is conductor and music director of the Maria Schneider Jazz Orchestra. And uh, finally, Carol Comer, who is an artist educator and is based in Kansas City. I hope you enjoy the panel, and at this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you. When we uh, were talking about this particular session, we thought that it would be impossible not to have Melba as a part of it, because the idea of uh, mentoring, the kind of uh, uh, thing that all of us who are players uh, go through in one way or another. We all, we all have someone that uh, taught us or took us by the hand and, and uh, kept us from making some of the mistakes that we might have otherwise made. Uh, mentoring with most men is uh, a little different what it's, uh, from what it seems to be with women. And it would seem to me uh, that there may be some things that we can talk about. Talk, listening to these women, all of whom have been mentored and who are mentors themselves now, uh, uh, what was special, what helped them do what they do. Um, I, I uh, grew up in Washington, D.C. and uh, had the good fortune to be mentored by people like Joe Jones, Papa Joe Jones, the drummer, with Count Basie, uh, uh, Duke Ellington, uh, Art Tatum. Well, these are all big names, but they did the same thing for Mary Lou Williams. They did the same thing for uh, many women that uh, we know about now. I mean, Mary McPartner, who will be with us a little later, uh, uh, all benefited uh, by being a part of that particular network. It seems to be a lot more difficult for women to get into the network. So uh, uh, it might be uh, useful for us to uh, perhaps start with Carol Comer who uh, produced a, a wonderful uh, women's jazz festival about 10, how long ago was that? The first one was in 1978. 20 years ago. Oh, yes, we incorporated in 77, 20 right. years ago. Melba was there. Well, Carol, just a little more about Carol. She's not only a fine singer pianist, but uh, she, in coming from the performance area, I mean, she's played for all kinds of folks. Uh, uh, anybody that comes to Kansas City that normally has her to play because she's, uh, not only very Chief. well known in the area, <laughs> <laughs> not only very well known in the in the area, but uh, has established herself first of all as someone who can do the job. So I mean, the, first of all, you got the you got the talent, and uh, she has the visibility and been able to do things uh, in a very special way. Why don't you tell us a, a little about first uh, uh, your own uh, mentoring, uh, how you were mentored, and then what you uh, attempt to do, how you attempt to. I was mentored in every area of my life. I used to write for Downbeat, and I would never have had the job 
of a guy by the name of Gary Shivers, who was Kansas City's correspondent when he moved to North Carolina. He'd seen some liner notes I'd written and some letters to the editor, and he said, you want to give this a shot? And he was wonderful, and in, I, I couldn't believe it. He was wonderful, encouraging, supportive, told Downbeat I'd be getting in touch with him, so I wrote for him for 10 years after that. My playing and singing, there's a lady from Kansas City named Marilyn May. Some of you may be familiar with her, an incredible singer. She, I had always been a stand-up singer, played only just you know messing around studio stuff. And she said, you ought to play for yourself. You'd work twice as much. She encouraged me, and it's true. If joint owners can get two for the price of one, they will, as you know. And Mar Marilyn encouraged me to start playing for myself, and my gig load doubled, and I've been doing it ever since. The festival, Maxine Adams of the Wichita Jazz Festival, a friend and I, I'd been there covering it for Downbeat, and a friend of mine had been covering it for the NPR station in Kansas City, KCUR. We came back on the turnpike that year in 1977. We said, we'd love to do something like that in Kansas City and feature women. And we got in touch with Maxine Adams in Wichita. She said she thought it was a great idea. She gave us some people to call and get in touch with. My friend knew Marion McPartland. Marion said, I'll be your East Coast rep. Anybody you want, let me know. Leonard Feather said, I'll be your guy on the West Coast. I mean, in every area of my life, I, I would never have been able to do anything without these wonderful people supporting, encouraging, mentoring, uh, believing in you. I think that's 90% of it, maybe 100% of it. So I hope that it's a very long answer to your question, Billy, but <laughs> that's some of, the, uh, some of the story of how I've been mentored. I try to mentor now because of all these things. Also, I think it's good for your soul. If you see somebody, last night I was just blown away by these people right here. And I, I can't wait to get back to Kansas City to tell the festival and performance people back there about these folks. Since we don't do our festival anymore, I want the Kansas City Jazz Festival and the Heritage Festival and all of them to know about Maria and Marion. I don't know if that's really mentoring or not. I'm just so yeah. crazy about what they do. I think the rest of the world deserves to hear them. So maybe that's part of mentoring, too. I don't know. Marion, how, how about you? When, uh, who was your uh, mentor? Well, I was really uh, fortunate because uh, Detroit is such a, I'm, Detroit is my hometown, that's where I, uh, my home base that I tour from, and it really has such a rich legacy of musicians that uh, came there, you know, brought their towns to the world, and, but on top of that, there actually is a wonderful cadre of musicians that still lives there. So uh, when I was about 15 years old, I was able to start working with a wonderful musician from my area called, uh, named Marcus Belgrave. Marcus is a really great trumpet player. And he was one of the first people to actually go out and hire me to play professionally for uh, a, a gig, to go out and pay me to play <coughs> bass. And uh, so I was able to get that from, from people like him. And there's another man in, that's still in Detroit by the name of Donald Walden, who's just a fantastic tenor player and educator. A man named Charles Bowles, who's just a brilliant pianist. And I mean, these are people that you know, kept me in gigs for like two, two and three years straight, you know, four nights a week, working all the time. And so I was able to really kind of hone my craft from just, you know, from sheer being on the stand, and then also from watching them a lot, seeing, you know, how they did business, what, you know, how they, how they worked they work certain things. So I was able to kind of get a little of a business understanding at the, at the same time. And then after, um, other than that, then I also had my wonderful bass instructors. There's some really great bass teachers that lived right there in Detroit. Um, one's name is Will Austin. Will, We'll play uh, quite, a, quite a bit with another really great female uh, pianist named Terry Pollard. Terry's from Detroit, and she was just fantastic. And he was uh, one of Terry's best bass players. And so Will took me under his wings and taught me just uh, so many things about you know, how, to, you know, how, to, how to control the bass, what to do on the bandstand, and things like that. So unfortunately, I didn't really have uh, very many uh, women as mentors, because most of the folks that were really playing actively were, were guys around there. But I was able, I was, but I really felt, it's funny, I never, I felt that they never made a distinction to me as, as being a woman player. It was mostly just, you know, this is Marion, we love you, you really, we know that you really have a very serious commitment to playing uh, jazz and playing the bass, and we want to see you, you know, do the best. 
Well, you named some of the best musicians uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that generation mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, uh, from Detroit. But there were some, uh, uh, Terry Pollard and Alice Coltrane, who yes. Alice, uh, what was her? Alice yeah. McLeod. McLeod, yes. Alice McLeod, <laughs> uh, before she was Alice Coltrane. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Harpers. Uh, yes, uh, Dorothy Ashby. Dorothy Ashby. Ashby. Mm -hmm. And there were so many women uh, that Good seemed work. to get uh, an opportunity to perform uh, with men. Was there something special? Uh, did you feel there, or did they just uh, judge people on town? I think that they just judge them on town. I think Detroit, I mean, I always felt that like Detroit is really, I still feel this today, it's really a proving ground for people. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can get through the Detroit, you know, in Detroit's a new circle of musician and real <laughs> musicians, then you really are fit to play anywhere in the United States. It's, <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, yeah. they, they don't really let you out of there unless you got your stuff together. You have to, <laughs> you, you, know, you, you know, I mean, and it's in the traditional yeah. sense too, um, Billy, sure. you know, yeah. I mean, no tunes, you know, be able to play tempos, all those kinds of real basic things that, that people do in terms of playing, being able to play jazz in a traditional, well, know how to read music, you mm -hmm. know, all those, you know, reading charts, all that stuff. You really have to have that together and they, you know, it's, it's a real serious business there, the, the business of jazz. Is, is I won't you know. scream on you if you don't play the right tempos. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's gotta be right every time. They, they do that, but it's such a good thing though, I mean, because, you know, it's, it's such a good thing that they hold us all to the same but, you know, all, yeah. everyone's feet to the same fire. I mean, yeah. you know, Terry Pollard, I feel like those women, Dorothy Ashby, Alice McLeod, I mean, those, those women, you know, I really hold them in such high esteem because, you know, you know those guys still shiver when you say Terry Pollard, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, she has been playing in the world. Yeah. She's had yeah. some, some health challenges, but, yeah. you know, but they used to say, you know, she was the kind of person where if you get on the stand, and if she didn't think that you were about anything, that she would call, call her blues in one key and play it in another key. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and really fast. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Terry Pollard, uh, some of you may have seen her with the Terry Gibbs uh, group and with some of the other groups that she played with. Uh, but she was a formidable pianist and a very fine vibist. I mean, she would challenge yeah. te uh, 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 Terry on vibes. I mean, they'd play two on the same vibes and everything. And she, she had to be careful. And because yeah. of it, she was, she was, she was formidable. Um, you had uh, one of the most visible mentors uh, in the business, Gil Evans. How'd that come about? Uh, in a very odd way. I, in New York City, I, uh, when I first moved to New York, I didn't really know how to break into the writing scene at all, and I needed to make some money, so I worked as a music copyist. And I actually was just working at a Xerox machine one day <laughs> when a composer came in and I Xeroxed his score. And, we got talking about music, and I was used to, at Eastman, where I went to school, I was used to always having a lot of musical conversations, and suddenly I was in New York, and I wasn't around musicians, really, and, and we got talking about music, and he said, well, let's get together for coffee, you know, I'd like to hear about, you know, your composing, and so we go out for coffee, and he starts asking me who my favorite writers are, and I made a list, but then I started talking about Gil Evans and saying all the different things I loved about all his different pieces, and this little section, and Clearly, my love for his music came through, but he didn't tell me at that point that he was closest friends with Gil. So that night I went home and he called me up and he said, well, I didn't tell you today, but Gil Evans is like my best friend and I called him up and told him about you today and he needs somebody to do some work for, for him and he'd like to meet you. So it started out, I met him at a, at a they were having a rehearsal. I started copying music and slowly as I got to know Gil better, he would have me do reorchestrations of his music because he started working in Europe with big bands um, that had a standard instrumentation, but his music was a smaller instrumentation. So he would have me reorchestrate those things. And then slowly, as he got to know my writing, um, he asked me when he had too much to write for a movie or something, he'd ask me to write some of the cues and things. So it was incredible. And I, the thing that you were saying is like when you're young, and for me, I didn't really believe in myself that much. But here, the person who you just, one of the people you love most in music believes in you. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a gift. It's such a gift. Because even now, sometimes when you know you think, oh, am I doing it right? It's like, OK, Gil thought I was doing it right. And that was 10 That's years great. ago. So OK, <laughs> All right, hopefully I'm just a notch above that now. So maybe hopefully he'd approve. And then if he approves, I'll approve. You know? yeah. So it, it really helps. And that, that was a big thing for me. But the other thing I would say is before him, um, maybe I think different than a lot of women in jazz, my first teacher growing up was a woman uh, in my hometown. And I was from a very small town in Minnesota, and there really wasn't any jazz there, except this woman, 
this one woman that had been transplanted there from Chicago in an odd way. Her, both her husband and her son had died within a month of each other. And she was this fantastic stride pianist from Chicago. And her only family left was her daughter, who happened to live in the sticks of Wyndham, in Wyndham, Minnesota. So she moved there when I was five years old. And my parents invited her over for dinner. And my first strong musical memory is this woman playing piano. And just uh, you could just feel the personality leaping out of the music. She was this really beautiful woman, bright red hair. And I immediately, you know, that kind of resonated with me. And, and, she be, and I, I immediately said, you know, I want to study. I want to be Mrs. Butler. And she, she was just wonderful for me. And so all the way until I was 18 years old and I went to college, the most respected person in the arts, even in Wyndham, because Wyndham didn't really have an arts. I mean, there, there, were some, there were some painters there, or whatever. But in general, it was kind of a farming community. And um, she was the most respected person. So I always looked to a woman in my childhood as being, you know, the pinnacle, the, yeah. the, you know, the, the amazing person that I hope to be like someday. And I think that had an effect on me. Sure. So yeah. Mm -hmm. You have uh, had some spectacular, also some spectacular uh, people who uh, believed in you. Uh, who were the first? Um, well, Miss Hightower was my very first uh, teacher. Yeah, she she's a teacher in uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I was I don't know. 12, 13, or something like that. And uh, she, I, I was, you know, I, I was going along very well. I, I, I could, could read or anything that she bought, you know, and played. So uh, I, just, I just went along with, them, with her until I was 16. And I joined the union, and uh, I, I, I was with men all, <laughs> all the time. After that, for a, for a long time, I was with Bard Ally uh, for a year or so. A lot of so. people don't know who Bard Ally was. Bard Ally was with the Chick Webb band? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. He, yeah. he directed when Ella Fitzgerald was singing. Mm-hmm, uh-huh. And, uh, with, with Gerald stole me uh, uh, from his band. I mean, Gerald Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I, you were with him when, when Gerald got when Gerald met you. Is that correct? Uh, or did he know you before? No, he. He uh, met you there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Gerald was one of your your uh, principal. Uh, yeah. Uh, mentors, mm -hmm. Gerald Wilson. Because I was writing for uh, Bardu. Uh, Already. Yeah. Because. The, you know, when the acts would come in, they'd have the, you know, they didn't have their music. Mm -hmm. No, nope, go on and write the music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to do it uh, at first, and I went back to school. My, co uh, my, my college uh, didn't have jazz, so I, uh, I didn't go. I mean, I. I went about two, three weeks because you didn't have jazz, so you didn't no. get it. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I went back to my high school, my high, uh, high school uh, polytechnic, uh, and, and uh, my teacher there was Mr. Wilson, and he played violin and trumpet, mm -hmm. and he played trumpet for jazz. And, Violin for classics, and I said yes, that's the way I want. To do. <laughs> and he he helped me get started uh, writing uh, for Bardu, uh -huh. and then. You so know, you, you know, with Bardu Ally, you had a wide variety of things to write. Did, did yeah. the shows change every week? Yeah, every week. Every week. So you had something different mm -hmm. every week to write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I didn't have to write every week. But uh -huh. the shows I, I would. Uh, Take their music up and mm -hmm. you know I'll, I'll look at it and I make sure it was all right. 
so uh, then Gerald, I, I was with him, I, he said eight years. <laughs> eight years? <laughs> did you do much writing uh, when you yes. were with Gerald? How yeah. did that come about? Because he's an arranger himself. Yeah, well, I, I was uh, his copyist uh -huh. first, and then uh, I was writing already, so he said, well, write this and write that. And so uh, we just, I, I, you know, started writing. Uh, he, he taught me a lot. And, uh, 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 Gerald, I mean, uh, I can't talk much. No, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> doing great. Uh, uh, Dizzy was next. Yeah. And, he, and well, uh, you know. How I, did you get with this? Did, did he hear you with Gerald? Gerald Wilson? I don't know. He just I hired you? No. Well, he came to California mm -hmm. and he said, never. Do this and do that and the other. I don't know how how, how we met now, uh -huh. but uh, I was writing for him from California and sending it back. To, uh, to so before York. you joined the band, you mm -hmm. were writing. Mm -hmm. So I, I was with the first uh, big band that he had about a year. Cold Train and all of them, mm -hmm. He's, and and I went back to New York, and he says. Where's your trouble? I, I did. I, I, I can come here as a copyist and arranger. I, I can come here for play. And so he says, "Well, I just got fired my trouble, trouble uh, player. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to start." And I had to wear these uh, old disguised. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, well, I mean, it's awful. They, they, they didn't fit nowhere. But anyway, <laughs> and he had to. But that was, that was traditional in big yeah. bands. So yeah. that, that wasn't directed at you. I had to do that, too. Or anybody who <laughs> worked with a big band, you know, whoever the last guy was, yeah. if he was little, he was like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, he had to, uh, he had to uh, borrow a uh, uh, rent. Uh, uh, Trombone? Uh, no, he didn't. Have, uh, he had a. Ran a bear tone. Oh, bear tone. Oh, yeah. You know, a horn. Right. And, and uh, you know, and then he finally, uh, I, you know, get sent home. And, and got your own horn. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when he, he broke up, well, I went on back to Daryl. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, we, you know, we just started writing. Well, we. We were still writing together. Uh -huh. uh, with when you were with Dizzy. Uh -huh. How did you meet Randy Weston? Well, I was with Dizzy, and I went up to play my little solo. And uh, Randy heard my solo. <laughs> he says, "I gotta have her." <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was the start of it. And and he says. You have to write something for me. And so I said, well, come on up to the house and put it down and all that. And uh, we, we did our first album, Little Niles. Little Niles. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just a, still a great album. It's a wonderful album. But and you know, Randy is, is, is such a different composer. The yeah. things that he does that. Mm -hmm. Very special, and you seem to capture that yeah. in, in the colors you use for, for, yeah, for it, his it, music. Yeah, it was something else. So I, I, I'm still writing for him. Yes, uh, he was here recently. Years. <laughs> yeah. He was uh -huh. here recently. Yeah, and, I know. Uh, he I, couldn't, I heard. He couldn't say enough about uh, the relationship. He said that uh, uh, you know it was so very special to him, and he felt it was so very important in his. Uh, uh, the manner in which it has moved him up in, in his career. So it's, yeah. uh, it's and, a big mutual thing going on there. Yeah, but uh, he was a start of my winter, too. I don't know how, but, but everybody, my mentor, uh, all the guys, I mean, all, all the guys uh, are my mentors. And, and, uh, Except when I I got my band of girls, 
you know, fail. Then uh, you were the mentor again. Yeah. <laughs> I had How, uh, you, you've been a mentor in, in many ways with when you taught in Jamaica. How yeah, did that come uh, about? Uh, uh, Dale took me down. Uh, no, uh, Randy took me down there. Randy took you to Jamaica? Uh-huh, because he has relatives down there. Yes, well, he has relatives in Africa. He has relatives all over. And uh, he took me down there. And uh, we, you know, we met a, a whole lot of musicians down there. And uh, he wanted to, they wanted me to stay, but I couldn't stay because, you know, they didn't have a place for me at that time. But uh, about six months or so later, they sent for me, and I stayed there five or six years. Five or six years. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we were talking earlier with Carol, and she said that she was one of the first to pry you out of uh, retirement. Uh, <laughs> what happened right. on that, Carol? We wanted her so badly for our first festival, and and we got in touch with Marion and she got in touch with somebody who had Melba's number in Jamaica and the first time we, I think this took about six months to finally <laughs> convince her. We started calling her in the spring and the summer and we said we just have to have you because we just adored her. I mean, her talent and her gifts and her everything about her, she just had to be part of our first festival and, and every time we call, you know, and she was so sweet and so polite and so no, <laughs> she would just say. It. But finally, I think around in the fall, I can't remember. It just seemed like it took forever because we wanted it so badly. But finally, <laughs> she consented to be uh, on our festival that first year, and we sort of brought her out of retirement. She'd been in Jamaica, and, and they loved her down there too. But we tried to pull her back, and thank God we were successful. <laughs> well, we've kind of uh, gone around uh, the panel as to personal experiences. Uh, what? based on these personal experiences. Does anyone have any suggestions to uh, uh, people who uh, are in a position to need mentors now? Now, many of the women that are on the festival are very, very talented. They need someone to do for them what has been done for us. So any thoughts on that? I think all you have to do is ask. I'll do, but I, not that I have any power at all, but if I can help somebody, and I'm sure they feel the same mm. way, all you have to really do is ask. Well, and if I, you deserve I, it, it'll happen for you. I, 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 guess, I guess my question is a little different. Uh, how do many, many uh, young musicians, male and female, uh, can't get to uh, someone? I mean, they're not as fortunate as, as, as Maria or, or, uh, so, or, or uh, any, any, any uh, or Melba or, or anyone who has had the opportunity just sort of thrust upon them. So how do you seek that out? Or what? I guess really what I'm saying is, how do you make it happen? Most, most of you are, are doers. I mean, I, got, I get the feeling from talking to you that if, it hadn't, if you hadn't uh, uh, met Gil in that way, you would have met him anyway. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, sure, yeah. I believe that. So, so any suggestions along the way? I think you have to have, I think you have to get your stuff together, have a good, accurate, up-to-date, impressive bio. I think you have to send it around and make telephone calls. It depends on what your goals are, but you have to be an active participant in mentoring. I mean, you can't just sit there and expect somebody to mm -hmm. come along and say, I love you, I'm going to make you a star. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you have to want it, you have to be qualified, and you have to get in touch with as many people as you can, and people that are going to be sensitive in your area. You know, uh, those are some of my suggestions. I've had kind of an idea, I've been spinning around in my head for a while about mentoring, because for me, growing up as a child, I think that maybe the thing that's missing is mentors when kids are younger. You know, because by the time you sort of have things together on your instrument or you can write, it's just a matter of being resourceful, you know, <laughs> in a way. But I was thinking um, that there must be a way to start a program. For instance, the way that I worked, up, the way I started working with Gil, and what she was describing was in the, in the very beginning, helping out a musician mentor um, with, with things that are, are very kind of basic. Mm. You know, every musician mm. I know mm -hmm. needs an assistant, needs somebody to do just yeah. work for them. Like so an apprentice. Needs an apprentice. Somebody, for me, sometimes I need somebody That's just true. to come to a gig, help me set up. And I was mm -hmm. thinking that there must be a way to go into schools, and schools that have kids that don't have parents that, you know, 
easily give them, you know, have all sorts of resources to give them opportunities. So maybe inner city schools in various cities. I was thinking in New York we could start this, and, and not just jazz, but mm -hmm. all the arts, and get the teachers in there to find kids that, you know, have some talent but don't really have any resources, mm -hmm. and match them up with artists in the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, girls with women mentors or men mentor, mm -hmm. you know, that it could be either, but match people up that the kid can come over, do some things, help be around the music or around the art or whatever they're doing, and in turn, give the kid a lesson or whatever. Let them be around the scene so that they can just see it and start to visualize that their life could be that someday. You know, that they don't, that, that they aren't limited and they're not living in some separate space and these people have that and I can only have this, but that they have this and I'm already a part of this. And, because I think once you visualize yourself in a, in a place, it's possible. So I don't know, what, what would it take to start some kind of program like that? It doesn't seem like it, just some organizational money and that's it. You know? Well, it would take a little more than that. Would, one of the things it would take, uh, uh, in New York they're starting the Annenberg uh, uh, Foundation and giving them a lot of money, so they're putting the art back in school. So this might be a good time there to, uh, uh, for people who live in that area to uh, match up individual artists, as you suggest, uh, with specific schools. Mm -hmm. Might be a school in your neighborhood or it might be a school that you relate to in, in some way. Uh, in Washington, D.C., with the with Kennedy Center, we do some things along those lines, but not in a mentoring, in that kind of a mentoring mm -hmm. situation. So maybe you might, uh, some of you might have some ideas of, as to what the Kennedy Center uh, could do along those lines. Well, um, I have a program that I was, I'm part of, uh, actually we started the first pilot program just last year called Sisters in Jazz. Mm -hmm. And this was started mm -hmm. by uh, a woman named Sunny Wilkinson, yes. who was, uh, who was uh, head of the, uh, the uh, women's, uh, chair of the women's committee of portion of IJE, mm -hmm. and Diana Spradling, who's one of the faculty at Western Michigan. Everybody know what IJE is, of course. Uh, Anyone who doesn't. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, that's the International okay. Association of Jazz Educators. Okay. It's a wonderful umbrella organization for, um, for players and uh, composers and uh, educators that exist um, right actually uh, all over the United States and they have yearly uh, meetings. As a matter of fact, I think the one that's coming up will be in New York if I'm not mistaken. And so we started this pilot program uh, last year and the and part of what it was supposed to do is just what you were talking about, is to really to pair young uh, women who were interested, we just kind of dealt specifically in jazz because that's the area that we know the best, with uh, women who are already professionals in the area. Um, we try to make this program to, to hone it so that um, the people, the young people that we chose, the students that were a uh, part of it, the protégés, actually had some knowledge of jazz, so they weren't coming to it uh, totally where we'd have to kind of bring them from square one. These are people that already had stated that they had an interest specifically in jazz, so they proved to us that they could do a little bit of playing. And we paired them up with people that were either musicians uh, or, or vocalists uh, in the, or just, or even composers in the area. And they, what they did was they met uh, about at least, at least two times or three times a month. And they would do a number of things. They would maybe go to a gig with the person, they'd go to a recording session, uh, maybe they would just sit around and maybe have a lesson if that's what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But they could really have a real intimate a time to kind of really talk on a one, on a one, with a one-on-one -on -one basis about <coughs> what, uh, what it means to really actually be a, a, a musician or a jazz musician, a composer. Uh, to really go out there and to do it, to work this. And to really also try, we're hoping to, and we found it over the time that we did, to get at some of the, you know, not just the rosy stuff, but also the stuff that's a little bit more difficult because that's the stuff that we find that people aren't really, they, they may not get, you know, there's some, you know, mm -hmm. that certainly every business has its challenges and you need to know what those challenges mm -hmm. are. And sometimes when you're just kind of sitting out in the audience and seeing people play, you just kind of look, it looks like maybe it's all just also easy when in fact we all know that and those of us in the business know that it, it really is quite a challenge to you know to stay in over a, the period of a person's entire career you know there are many uh, peaks and valleys and so we want to talk to make sure that we talk to the people about 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 those things too and then my my thing is also that I think that there's some issues that are particular to women that we need, as women, we need to talk about a little bit. And I know I think they get kind of glossed over a little bit because I, and I understand this because I think that, you know, we want to be sure that we are accepted 
as musicians first. You know, that our professionalism is not glossed over uh, and because, of, because of gender issues. But the fact, are, if there's a, there, the fact is that there are certain kinds of gender issues that need to be discussed a little bit. Frankly, I'm a mother, and I know that there, there's probably other women out there that are mothers and musicians too. And you know that that kind of thing needs to be touched. But I mean, you know, when a guy has a when a you know one of the cats on the stand has a new baby, they come out of the stand and said, "Hey, I had a kid last night." But when I had a new baby, <laughs> excuse me, but I was off the stand for about six months. <laughs> okay, I had to go back and get my gigs back from somebody. You know, the, you know that that kind of thing. I mean, it's, and those are real issues. I mean, you know, there may be not real issues for those, you know, of, of those of us who are musicians and women who have not children to do this. But those of us that are, you know, I have two of them at home. And, you know, right now, you know, I've got to, I have to get somebody not to just babysit for a night, but I've got to get somebody to babysit for three nights, you know, days and nights. And those, those kinds of little things are, are things I think that are, are, are important to talk about. So when, when our Sisters in Jazz program, we try to get real broad in that. We try to talk about, you know, try to talk about the professional aspects and then, and allow people to, you know, to deal with a whole range of issues that, you know, that might be a, affecting them. And, 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 and it's been working really nicely. As a matter of fact, we're trying to uh, make it available. We're trying to codify the program so that it can be available to other states to start their own Sisters in Jazz program and really and have that for other people to, to uh, try to bring women in, to mentor them, keep, to get them in, and to keep them in, too, which is, I think is a real important thing. Well, you've uh, touched on you uh, uh, it. I, I want to say okay. many, many times people uh, your 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 parents aren't uh, interested in jazz or anything, mm -hmm. and you gotta gotta have that to go, to go along with because you, you you gotta you gotta learn how to deal with it and mm -hmm. and, 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 yeah. and and overlook or I don't know be a part of somebody uh, else's family or something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, for, uh -huh. because I, 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 I'm, right now I'm, I'm sort of in that category, me, after All <laughs> uh, my mother died, and every, you know, my auntie died and everything, so uh, my auntie just left. She's uh, she's not interested in jazz, but she used to go with me. But uh, she would talk about her her dancing and uh, was it yeah group dancing and all that stuff. Oh yeah, okay. And and uh, she wasn't interested in my jazz at all, and it. Uh, you have to you get around that. I don't know how you can, you, you guys can, you guys can say it because I can't say it, but tell them about that because yeah. it's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. What, uh, with the Sisters in Jazz, what uh, uh, do you think could be, uh, should be, uh, the uh, manner in which uh, people here can participate in that? Um, mostly, I think it really is, tends to be a program that's really more for people that are actually in, um, in, the, in, the, in the field, uh, mostly for musicians, and for artists, artists and protégés, for well, young, many of these young people. people. Are. But so, um, um, actually, if you would uh, like to know some information on it, I would be glad to, um, you could give me your name and address, and I'd be glad to personally send you any inf information that we have, because we are, we are getting it together on a, for a state-by-state -state basis. But what we need actually is people from a state that might be interested to come forward and volunteer to actually start the program in their, uh, in their state. We actually, because we were able to do the uh, pilot program, program on an absolute shoestring, that now we've made it possible for people to start it on a state-by-state mm -hmm. -state basis with a little bit of seed money. And uh, that's basically just to cover administrative costs because there's certain costs associated with doing it, you know, mailing, Sending transportation, stuff, yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. So I mean, it's not no one's going to 
It's, it's a really important program, though, and it, it can be done uh, on each state. And I'd be glad to take any, any numbers. And right now, we're getting together a handbook so that people can kind of see the things that we did and how we, how we went, went ahead and did the choosing of the people and all that. But we were really pleased with the results. We had six mentors and six protégés that participated. And everyone uh, was really, really pleased. And not only that, but I think that from doing that, we actually started some long-term associations. And that was the real, you know, part of the real point was it wasn't just people just got in there because it was a one little mm -hmm. program. But I think we got some people there that really, really connected. You know, we got yeah. a group of people. We're starting to kind of get the interfacing and inter a net network of people that know each other and want to and want to be involved. Yeah. And that really is what we're talking about, right? It's just. Yeah. Just expanding the network. Stay, stay, stay together. Mm -hmm. Stay together for their That's whole right. life. That's right. right. Yes. So, Dr. Taylor, you said you were fortunate enough to be mentored by Duke Ellington and Art Tatum. I want to know how this happened. Where, where did, how did Duke Ellington uh, mentor you and Art Tatum? And uh, can you well, tell us about that? This was a different time, and it actually was. Uh, 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 I was a pain in the neck, <laughs> and so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, uh, all of the guys that, that uh, I looked up to, I made uh, sure that uh, I got to talk to them and ask questions, and uh, they were very, very uh, helpful because uh, Ellington and uh, uh, Joe Jones, or uh, Tatum, Ben Webster, Colin Hawkins, all of those guys appreciated someone who knew their work and uh, asked intelligent questions about what they, why they did what they did and so forth. And I didn't do it all the time. I, I got to socialize with him. I got to take, I was Tatum's protege, so I took him around to different places and, and things like that. But this was, this was not peculiar to me. I mean, they did this uh, with, with the, uh, like Randy Weston went, went to meet uh, 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 Coleman Hawkins, and that was when he first met Thelonious Monk. I mean, because mm -hmm. Monk was playing piano with him. Mm -hmm. And so he got friendly with, with Monk through Hawkins. And so there was this kind of network where these musicians were available in very small clubs. The clubs were on 52nd Street and, and Minton's and places like that only held about 7,500 people. Yeah. So I mean, it was maybe this many people in the club. And, and uh, so you can access to everybody. You don't have that anymore in the concert or even in the clubs. I mean, the clubs, you got a minimum. You get out as soon as the show is over. Uh, uh, the, 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 the situation is totally different. So I guess what I'm looking for from those of you and on the panel is uh, given the different situation, is it possible to uh, come around to something similar to what I, I was fortunate enough to grow up with? Where did you have access to them here in Washington? In clubs? No, the no. Theater? Uh, uh, well, in Washington here, yeah. uh, uh, you, you, this, uh, I can't emphasize too much that this was a different time. Right. There was, uh, Washington was in the south of the prejudice. Yeah. Uh, Duke Ellington could not stay at the Watergate as I did. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, could, he, 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 could, he could, couldn't stay in, 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 in some of the places he played. You know, so he stayed uh, uh, around the corner from my grandfather's church. So I, could, I saw, saw him walk, uh, walking to, to the theater. Okay, now, now this is this is a superstar who's already been to Europe, uh, who who has been played for the crown heads of Europe and all all that stuff. And he's walking down Seventh and P. You know, and I say, hey, uh, Mr. Ellington, uh, you know, <laughs> 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 you can't do that necessarily anymore. You know, I just wanted to say that uh, in New York we have an organization called the International Women in Jazz. And it has a mentoring program. In fact, we give uh, concerts at uh, St. Peter's Church once a month. And we have some of our uh, membership. In fact, the membership is now somewhat over 200 uh, ladies and gentlemen, too. We have men in the organization, too. Frank Owens is one of our members. And uh, we help the younger people to learn how to produce a concert and uh, all of the things that have to go with uh, uh, giving a concert or, or la launching or producing a concert. But all the behind the scenes uh, situations that you have to deal with other than just being a musician. But unfortunately, a lot of musicians don't think about the business end of things. Mm -hmm. So that's where we come in to help fill in all those spaces or we are beginning to, of course, uh, there are also, uh, we have meetings once a month in which we bring up a lot of issues that we want to uh, deal with that have to do other than the music. So we're on our way to doing that sort of thing to help people in the New York City area. Mm -hmm.
One, one of the Absolutely. things that I had hoped uh, to happen here at Kennedy Center, knowing that there were these embryonic groups uh, uh, beginning, was uh, to have some coming together here. Uh, we provide the place, but uh, I was hoping that there would be uh, more uh, women from representing those organizations uh, so that we could get uh, um, some dialogue going in this context about what the Kennedy Center and other places could uh, be doing to be helpful. We're putting on a concert, so we've, we've taken the first step, but there are, are uh, other things that, that might, uh, uh, you might bounce off of having done the concert, uh, those of you who played on the concert and so forth, uh, um, could get the word in, in, in certain ways, but we would really like uh, your cooperation and your input uh, and uh, your assistance, if you will, uh, in, in making this the thing that we'd all like to see, which is, uh, uh, unnecessary for it to be called the Women's Jazz Festival. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, here we have, uh, 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 there's a gentleman standing in the back who uh, is Vice President in charge of education and also jazz, uh, Derek Gordon, who's standing there. And, and Derek uh, uh, has been uh, very uh, conscious of uh, uh, really uh, including women in many of the things that we do, both in education and, and uh, uh, in jazz in particular. And so if you look at our singer series or some of the other things that we do, a lot of women, piano players, I mean, you know, so uh, uh, we do that to what extent we can, money and, and other considerations uh, taken into consideration. Uh, but so we, as I said, we're taking the first step. What we, what we would like is, is some input is where do we go from here? I mean, we're, we, we as a, a group, not just we at Kennedy Center. Uh, Derek? To follow up on that uh, great open door that Billy gave me, I would really like to encourage the group that you mentioned, uh, as well as this other project, to consider uh, coming to Washington during the time of the next Women in Jazz Festival, which will again be in May. It'll be late May next year. That but to use back. that, use that <laughs> as an opportunity to convene and to build on that. These sessions and other sessions that we develop were really developed to be of service uh, to you and, and to get more recognition for the great good work that you're already doing and that women have done for such a long time. Um, I have to tell you that uh, while Dr. Taylor uh, knows everyone from the artistic side, I'm the one who has to get on the phone and call them <laughs> and convince them to come. And uh, we certainly have run into that question about uh, women in jazz versus jazz without uh, gender, so to speak. And um, I think it's important to recognize that we are, we are working against something. So we're first trying to get the attention of people. And we know that once we get their attention, it will no longer be a question. So it's, it's sort of a balancing act that we're trying to do. But I think we all share the same goal in terms of recognizing excellence in jazz performance as excellence in jazz performance. Yes. I'm Nancy Ann Lee. I'm a freelance jazz journalist. And I have to say that these women in jazz festivals are excellent because as journalists, often, on, unless somebody's CD comes across our desk or we attend a concert or something, often we don't know about many of these people. And it's so refreshing to see women on the stage. Mm -hmm. It really is. I know the first time I, I saw Straight Ahead, Marion knows how thrilled I was to, to see an all-female group really kicking butt. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, this, is a, this is a great thing. I, and for the time being, I certainly want to continue to see more women in jazz festivals until it's so totally accepted that you don't have to put labels on it. Thank you. Now, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, uh, when Carol Comer Carlina, uh, hi. hi. So good to see you again. <laughs> Can I just tell them just briefly about you? I'm sure you already know what a wonderful bassist she is and singer. Yes, when absolutely. we did our first, yes. <laughs> when we did, um, I, I didn't know you were back there. When we did our first festival, Mary Lou Williams, of course, when this festival is named, of course, she was invited to participate. And Carlene and Mary Lou were part of performing Mary Lou's Mass as, on Palm Sunday as part of our first Women Jazz Festival. So good to see you again. Thank you. And I want to say, in, in uh, following what you just said, uh, when you had your first jazz festival, Mary Lou called me. Now, she was one of my mentors. Yeah. She called me to uh, join her at the festival right. in Kansas City. And uh, for a lot of women, 
that may be the first time, with, at least back there 20 some odd years ago, when a lot of women even saw other women. That's right, it because was. Because they may not have even come out of their particular territories until it was, there was something like the uh, Women's Jazz Festival. That's right. But we would like it to be, you know, uh, I would like it to be, and I'm sure everybody, of course, would like it to be to the point where women will go anywhere. They w I think in some cases, some women may be a little intimidated mm -hmm. by the oh, whole yes. atmosphere, and they may not want to play with, with men generally. I mean, I, it didn't, never bothered me. But there may be some young ladies who feel a little intimidated, and they don't mm -hmm. want to play with men. They, mm -hmm. rather, they feel more at home with other women. So mm -hmm. I think we have to break that down, too. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot no. of women feel well, comfortable. It's easy the other way around for, for us. No. Uh, we, uh. We, I've been criticized. I gave Carol the same criticism that I'm now taking. I was doing NPR, and I said to Carol, why have we got so many men on the Women's Jazz Festival? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we were almost picketed yeah. our first sure. year by the feminists in Kansas uh. City who didn't think Leonard Feather should be there, who didn't right. think uh, Lou Tobacken should be there with yeah, right. Mushiko. <laughs> so we had to fight. Uh, well, we had to fight the feminists in Kansas City. Uh, uh, the, uh, because we, uh, we didn't know, we were j just babies in this business and we didn't know from being politically correct. So, you know, we had to let them know that this was not a separatist organization. Yeah. We had been, you know, separated and kept out before and we didn't want to do that to anybody. So that's an interesting but, but point. But also, it, 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 it's, it's not fair if someone like Maria has a band and, or Toshiko has a band. These are people who know her music and who do it best. That's so, right. So you can't argue on an artistic basis, and the, and the, art, the artist is entitled to bring whoever is best suited to play her music, whatever that is. So I don't, you know, I can deal with that. But uh, uh, by the same, by the same token, uh, uh, what you run, what I run into, is 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 uh, frequently people when you say, okay, who are the women? Yeah, uh, they are in groups. How many people remember the the female group? Uh, that are, are various female groups that are not all female groups. I mean, if you talk about the George Shearing Quartet, very few uh, quintet, very few people remember Margie Hunt. They remember a lot of other folks, but they don't think they, they don't remember her as being a woman in that in the original group that made the, the sound that everybody talks about. Okay, uh, uh, in, uh, unfortunately, when when a woman is singly successfully, many people don't remember Melba Liston being in, in, in Dizzy's band and in and, 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 and Quincy's band and, and, and being in all these very visible bands because though she soloed and though she wrote and though they, she was given uh, plenty of, of, of credit by those musicians, they know her from, from, from Randy Weston because that's a different thing and it's just the two of them. And, and so you, you get her as an artist as opposed to, to her as a part of a trombone section which is a part of a larger band. It's too, it's too easy for women to get lost. Uh, my point is, mm -hmm. it's too easy for women to get lost in that context. And, uh, so unfortunately, we, we just tend to, to gloss over it. So the, the, fe the festivals, I believe, serve a, 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 a positive uh, 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 role in being able to focus on an Ingrid Jensen who, who comes out and blows everybody away, or somebody who can, mm -hmm. who can do mm -hmm. uh, some, something that, that uh, standing right, right by a guy saying, okay, check this out. Uh -huh. and, and, and so that, 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 that's, that's very good, but you need the straight ahead and you need the Uptown Spec Quartet and, and Jazz Bird Jam and where you can see women doing, uh, and just like she says, kicking butt on, on uh, their own terms. So mm -hmm. you, 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 there, there is no question about the, 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 the relation of, uh, relationship uh, of talent. Mm -hmm. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, it's uh, a question of the men, uh, 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 angrily, uh, uh, there there men out there that are angry mm -hmm. at men, uh, women, and, uh, and and that's why a lot of people don't like to. I mean, a lot of uh, females don't like to go mm -hmm. with the men mm -hmm. because of the anger, and it is out there. It's out there. You it's bet. out there. You bet. So we got to go. We got to deal, deal with that. You know, got to deal with that too. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? I don't know that. Anybody <laughs> got any suggestions? You oh. have to have more confidence. Mm -hmm. Sure. And okay. I think it. I mean, you either talk to them on their own terms. I've had to deal with this a lot because I'm a singer, mm -hmm. and and little by little you tell them what you really think. And I th and also 
I try to make friends with them too, but I mean, a lot of times they don't give you any room. They don't, mm -hmm. like the, the group I'm working with now, they don't want to rehearse. They come up at, when I'm up at the mic and like they change the plan. There was no plan, you know, and I just said, I should have just held my guns and say, I need to have a rehearsal. I need to know something up front because, you know, it's, I've just started working with them and they're nice people, but they don't, they just want to do it their way. Hi, uh, on the work, what kind of circumstances do you work? What I work, at, I work for my job at the World Bank and they have no, a no, World, no. I mean, World Bank Jazz work. Society. So. The, uh -huh. They've been playing together for a long time. They're all Europeans, uh -huh. and they've been playing together maybe two to three years. And I've just started singing with them. I see. And they don't want to rehearse because they've already worked together, and uh -huh. I have not worked with them. Mm -hmm. And so I asked for a rehearsal this week. Do you week. use music at all? Yeah, we're using yeah. music. Why don't you bring your own things in and say play I this? I do. I'm singing my yeah. stuff, but um, that's another thing in terms of what you're talking about. Um, what we need, yeah. what I need right now, is a sight singing workshop. And I was asking around, you know, where could I find this? Sight, sight singing. Also need a master class, like a master class to work with maybe other women. But mainly, I need to learn how to read music. Mm -hmm. I haven't studied. I didn't sing for a long time. But that's e even wonderful. even though uh, at this point uh, you don't. Uh, one of the things that I teach at the University of Western Massachusetts. One of the things that we do there is that the singers have to come in with their lead sheet and their key mm -hmm. uh, and parts for everybody. Then the guy, I don't have any excuse as a piano player to say, well, what key are you in? Or I, I don't want to do this modulation. Or I didn't hear you doing that. There it is. You know, it's up mm -hmm. to me to do it. You, know? you don't have to. Someone can do that for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, all you have to know is what you're singing. You, you said, this, this is what, I know that I do, I go from here to there, and I do so and so and so. This is my background. Here, Billy. You know? Yes. Here in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of resources to develop certain skills that you may be looking for. The Levine School of Music uh, has sight singing courses uh, and, or, and sight reading courses uh, because we work with them with a lot of uh, young musicians that we work with in the education program. And I think in many of your communities, you will find that there, there are community music schools um, that, that have these programs. And um, I would encourage you to partner with them. And if you need a particular type of program, talk with them about what you need and about the audience that you'll be bringing in terms of people like you who are doing jazz. And I believe that they would actually be very interested in developing a program to really fit your needs there. So I, I understand what Billy's saying. But if you want to learn to read music, which is not a bad idea, that's one way to do it. Yeah, I wasn't discouraging you to, from, from doing that. but. Just, uh, yeah, I don't want you to wait for that, was my point. Right here, also. When, yeah, she was next, anyway. Yeah. Um, I was going to talk about something I've been doing that I think is relevant well, to the topic. So the yeah, I was going to talk about something I've been doing which I think is relevant to the topic. Um, I'm writing an article on this, but I've, I've started a group with about six different women around the country called Jazz is Healing. And the reason that we started this is because um, I think from the beginning, jazz when the instruments were picked up, it came from the spirit and from the soul, and it kind of resonated a different way of dealing with music than just kind of that regimented, you do it this way and there's no other option. It teaches you improv, it teaches you set rhythms, it teaches you all kind of things you have to deal with in life. Mm -hmm. So with women especially, looking at jazz as healing, we've worked with women who have been in battered situations, We've worked with young children, young, young girls who are coming up who want to express what's inside of them. And they pick up an instrument, and if it squeals, and if it screams, and if you play Coltrane for them, they can say, I scream through this feeling out of me. And what, I, what I've been experiencing, and this is in many places. I've, I, uh, I'm originally from Oklahoma, and, and I'm Irish and Indian. So it, believe it or not, there are a lot of Native American jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. and, and so this has been an opportunity for us to work with people that are, are not literate in, in, a, in a certain sense of the, this culture. And I think their, their literacy is very unique. And this is a new group that could be brought into jazz. And I don't want jazz to become this thing where you have to just read music in this way and know all these kinds of people that have done these riffs. I really want it to stay this alive music tradition. So with this idea of music as healing, which we all say, but this very special thing that jazz has, and I think this could be very helpful for women. 
because when it comes down to looking for a musician, like what you said about Maria's orchestra, yes, Maria can choose any musician that she wants to be a part of her orchestra, but when it comes down to say, I've heard so often, where are the women musicians? Just like it used to be, where are the African American engineers? Where are the Native American pilots? They're there, but we have to take another step, and we have to start as, as a healing, because for there is the anger, there is the issue of women being single parents. There are all these reasons that women are not up on the stand. There's like all the women in the bands. When you look at the high schools, about half the high school band is women. Mm -hmm. But what happens? Where do they go? That's, that's, they're not welcome. There's this anger. There's this whole situation of jazz is a different domain. So <coughs> if anybody is interested in joining with us, we're small. There, like I said, there are six locations now. But I like to collaborate so that this, this scream can be turned into someone who hones their craft and learns to read music, learns to write, learns to take it to a different level rather than just stop at the screen. So. Can I yes. say something for a minute? Yes. I just want to say something about the anger just briefly. I have a real, real, real small way that I try to diffuse it. When I do workshops in high schools, a lot of times I'll work with jazz bands, and the majority of the membership are guys. And I have this little recorded cassette blindfold test that I put together, and I, I tell them there are men and women on this, and I want you to listen because uh, they all think they can tell when it's a woman and when it's a man playing. I have, and I don't tell them who anybody is, for my piano players, for instance, I have Bill Evans and I have Joanne Brackney. Guess who they think is which? Right. <laughs> <laughs> my point being, I have 10 musicians on the tape. I have Stacy Rolls, I have Clark, I have different musicians, different styles. And, and I, oh, I also have a little thing. I put 20 bucks on the table and I say, if anybody can get them all right, you know, mark M for male, F for female. I only play a little snippet of the, each one, maybe a minute and a half of each one and I play 10 musicians, male and female, and I, the 20 is when, it, oh man, we, this is easy. You got one for each of us? I've been doing this in my workshops now for 15 years. I have yet to have a kid guess it. And, and I know it's not, a, and the best part of it is, at least they leave that room, number one, respecting women musicians more, number two, realizing that there's no difference, they're talented. So it's a little teeny way. I, I, I advise all of you who are in arts education to try this. It's a, and you can put together with your own cassettes and tapes. It's, a, it's, it's my little blindfold test, and I offer that to you to try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, now. Yes. One was that also back to What I would like to do to help is um, I'm from Pennsylvania. My name is Vera Everett. And I have an entertainment agency. I specialize in jazz, blues, and classical music. What we provide for the musicians and vocalists is professional representation, assistance, and employment opportunities. And what I'm hearing is, in terms of assisting them, there are so many. There is just a plethora of talent in the tri uh, tri-state area looking for assistance so that they can go to the next level. What I'd like to do is make certain that everybody gets a business card and as I continue to meet with the, uh, the young musicians and vocalists, be receptive uh, to the calls that are going to be coming to you so that we can t together take them to the next level in their career development as a jazz uh, musician or vocalist. In what ways do you do that? Excuse me? In what ways do you take someone from, uh, say, an entry level to the next level? Well, I basically have them come in and consult with me, and uh -huh. I talk to them to find out just how serious they are about what it is that they want to do. Uh -huh. I find out where they have gone, where they've been, where they are now, and where they'd like to go. And from that, I begin to develop a strategy on what I ascertain their needs are, and then that's how you begin to take them to the next level. Some of them are on a very local level and have no clue, except for that they're interested in music. Uh -huh. Some have already... Um, uh, gone into the studios and released their own CDs and so forth and so on, and they need some doors to open to them. Just like what you were saying last night, Dr. Taylor, straight ahead is, is all that to me. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed the entertainment that was provided last night. But how do, we, how do you take them to the next level? How do you get to hear them on the radio as much as you may hear some of the others? 
it's, it's part of what it is that I'm doing as a professional agent. And I say as a professional agent because I'm licensed and bonded to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And the attorney, so that in a sense provides a, a comfort level. The attorneys that I'm working with or that are working for Exclusive Choice are going to make sure that all the necessary licenses and things are in place so that I can continue to cover the Mid-Atlantic region, finding the talent out there who's looking for quality representation, not someone who's going to take advantage of them, make sure that the people that they're referred to are reputable and credible people, and that we can help them to get to the next level. And maybe you can hear Straight Ahead or some of the others on the radio as more often than we do now. I've never heard Straight Ahead. And last night after seeing them, I thought, why not? You know, now I have access to all the radio stations all across the country. I'm going to be making calls to them, visiting them, and trying to set up interviews for different artists. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but it can start, like you said, right here. Mm -hmm. Everyone being receptive to the needs of the jazz community from a global perspective. Derek, following up on that question, so the Kennedy Center is also looking for ways that it can be of more service. Um, some of you may know or you may not know that from last year's Women in Jazz Festival, there were five radio programs that were developed and that were aired uh, on national public radio as part of Jazz Set. Uh, so it was, it was a way of featuring a number of the musicians who performed on the program uh, with the help of Becca Pulliam and, uh, and her staff we're recording the festival again this year, and we hope to have just as many uh, programs developed out of that material. Um, we, are, we are also looking into the possibility of using the material in another way. Now, that's always a mixed bag, because we also need to be you know, equitable and uh, be sure that all of the musicians who are playing are getting uh, you know, what they deserve out of that kind of an opportunity. But it may be that if we can create some kind of a women in jazz CD and use that as a way of promoting the individual uh, groups that are on the program. Granted, it won't be a full CD of one group, but it will perhaps get some attention. Perhaps we can use the marquee value of the Kennedy Center in getting people to pay attention to it, uh, and we'll certainly be investigating those opportunities. Obviously, we'll have to investigate them individually with each and every group that's on there. But it is something we're thinking about. Again, if there are other ways or other ideas that you have, uh, how we can help, uh, that's why we're here. And that's why Dr. Taylor is, is with us here at the Kennedy Center, because he's a great person to work with to make these things happen. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm from California, from San Francisco area. But I think one of the things that no one's talked about is paying dues in terms of working gigs, all kinds of gigs. The women have to get together, have a trio, quartet, whatever, for certain kinds of jobs. And so that they learn their instrument, learn their horn, uh, their drums, whatever they play, so that when they're we're ready to go in and they're lucky enough to get in working with me men or other women, that they're ready, so they, they can perform on their horn. Um, and uh, I think that's something that people, of course, Disc jockeys have taken over a lot of those kind of gigs, uh, the bar yeah. mitzvahs and the Italian weddings and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't hire musicians anymore because they're supposed to be too expensive. But um, I think that's important. And I, I don't know if young women musicians see that or understand that. You know. Well, mm -hmm. I, th I think, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just agreeing. Oh. I think that, that uh, many of the uh, young people that I meet, both male and female, are creating jobs. And I think the point that Melba made uh, uh, is, is one that needs to be addressed perhaps uh, uh, more quickly than some of the others. Uh, that is the anger among, uh, and real jealousy uh, uh, of, of, of uh, a man who feels he doesn't play as well as a woman playing the same instrument. Uh, uh, the, it's different. It's kind of like uh, you know, for too many men. It's kind of like uh, having women basketball players or, or baseball players or something. Uh, it's supposed to be a man's uh, macho or whatever. And uh, uh, to see somebody uh, who's female slam dunking uh, kind of blows the image. And uh, uh, the, the, but in, in jazz, uh, it has been, we have so many examples of people who have already passed that barrier. And I think that it, it behooves women to know who they are and to present them uh, in a way that helps the whole group 
uh, the, the point of, of African Americans was, was brought up earlier. Uh, one of the, 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 the things, we invented the music. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have difficulty in is, is people who are not African Americans, who speak the language without accent, and who, who really are, are doing it a lot better than some of our kids because they don't have the same advantages in terms of uh, uh, what goes on in the very early ages that were, were being talked about. And so uh, the, 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 these, are, these are problems which uh, are solvable. And I think as far as women are concerned, uh, one of the things that, that uh, uh, one of the things we could do is to take the Stacy uh, public thing. Rolls. Rolls, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stacey, Stacey Rolls and Terry Lynn Carrington and, and uh, um, um, the, the people who are really, uh, for instance, Stacy is, is from the West Coast. We've been trying to get her here for uh, last year, this year. Uh, she had another gig last year. She was on, on, the, on the roster last year, couldn't come. Uh, the reason for that is I try to get people from the West Coast, like Maiden Voyage, simply because they don't play their records here. Right. I mean, yeah. They don't play the records. So a lot of people don't, don't know that, that, that this is a good band. The same thing is true of Diva on the West Coast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, the less, le comes less, to the uh, less, uh, you. you know. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I think uh, we might do as, uh, uh, as a basic group that's interested in this, as individuals, uh, is to do whatever we can to, to make sure that the, the word gets out. You know, there, there are any, uh, 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 to ignore uh, uh, what people can do uh, is, is, is something that is a part of the business, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sitting looking at uh, 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 we, um, a man who did uh, some work on John Coltrane's music, which everybody relates to, Edward White. He said that. And, and, uh, Everybody else takes a bow that, that, that the Coltrane record, the Coltrane this, the Coltrane that. This is the guy who did the groundwork that everybody is basing all of this stuff on. There's no credit, you know? I mean, he's not crying, but I mean, he's, he's got a good career. He's doing, he teaches, he does what he, he does. But that's not the point. The point is that he should be on another level as mm -hmm. far as, as, as knowing mm -hmm. who he is and what he's done. And this is the, the kind of thing that you're saying. So it's not peculiar to women, but I think you, you have an oppor uh, opportunity to do something about it. You have to kind of tell me. I can't tell you. <laughs> yes. Um, as far as what you asked for us to do in this case, when I got the original flyer, I wanted to contact you to ask, because it said bring your own horn to the jam sessions. And I said, I certainly hope that you also mean bring your own voice, because most women, <laughs> many music, women who are musicians are singers. Yeah. So, but, but when I called to get your number, they said, well, he's not really here. He's somewhere else. So I think if you're the contact or whoever's the contact, we need a contact number. That's first. I'm from the PR background. The second thing is having a, if we all have email address, we can easily create an email network, a distribution network. When you called here, what, what number did you get? I got the 416 number that was on the purple flyer, and I got someone named Kevin. Yeah. So anyway. That but should we, have been, he should have been the right person. He was nice right to talk person. to. But what, 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 what did you tell him? Oh, he was fine. I just said I would like to, to contact you to tell you. To, uh, oh, that but you should talk to him. You okay, had, you fine. Had the right person. We just need to know who it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll make we'll make that clearer next time. Okay. The other thing yeah, is that he could have told you that you were welcome. Okay. Okay. The other thing is the journalists. There are journalists out here, and a lot of them are yeah. female. And I know two disc jockeys on WPFW, myself, Merk Hoffman and um, Pascal Nuama, and they be. These are the people to give the records to, also. And I think mm -hmm. if there isn't one, we should create a list of the journalists to send the a releases to the journalists, the journalists, both yeah. the newspaper and the uh, radio journalists so that they get the flyers on the, ri on the albums or they get the albums themselves. The we females are even more receptive than the males to playing the music. We have been uh, uh, very, uh, we welcome all the help we can get with new names, but we have uh, uh, people who are working with us who've been able to contact all of the regular people, the people that we normally go to for jazz, for jazz, uh, and this is a compilation of, of several lists uh, of, of people that uh, we work with. We always welcome different names, anyone that, that's missing we want to put on there. But uh, 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 we have been getting uh, back from those people uh, the same kind of uh, reaction that we get uh, to any uh, musician, male or female. Uh, what records do they have? And in some cases, they don't have any. Uh, who, uh, uh, you know, what have they done? Uh, what, what kind of reputation do they have? And, and that's not, for us, mm -hmm. 
that's not the point. I mean, I, I, how do you, uh, the, the paying dues, which, which someone one mentioned, what, we, what we're trying to do is to showcase people who are on a certain level already. Now, they may or may not have, most of the people on, on, the, on the festival do have records, but, but uh, 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 it may not be a new record. I mean, it may not mm -hmm. be uh, come out last week or something. So some guy uh, who writes may say, well, I don't want to review them. I already reviewed their record. So, well, that's not the point. They're going to be here. And, and so, so it, yeah. it, 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 we, these, are, these are minor problems, and they're solvable. I mean, we, we will, with your help, we'll, we'll be able to do, do some of it. But that's what exists. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the problem. Yes. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, say a couple things. You brought up so many things to think about. But um, one thing went, that comes to mind is um, from Blood on the Fields, Wynton Marsalis, it keeps running through my head lately that it really, the freedom is in the trying and in the doing. And I'm glad that at least I can hear that song. But because but, um, for me, singing jazz is particularly because of my upbringing and my culture and my, my life experience. So I was sort of caught off guard when the one lady was bringing up that it isn't particularly feminine. It seems like when I went and heard Michelle Rose Water up in um, Rose Woman, Rose Woman. yeah, mm -hmm. Rose Woman up at um, Sweet Basil, and I heard some guy at the bar. You know, they were saying, "Well, how is she?" You know, and the other guy was like, "You know, oh, she's a woman." You know, and I felt like <laughs> I thought, "Well, yeah." You know, I mean, that that seems like it shouldn't be that she's trying not to sound like a woman. I mean, you know, she's she's got her whole experience, and and the other thing that you said, the thing that I try to combat, the anger. I noticed that for a long time as a vocalist, it was really difficult. But the last two years when I decided to change the repertoire, if I come up and I want to sit in with Joy Spring and I want to scat you know, Clifford Brown's solo, or if I want to you know, do I Can't Get Started and I want to sing, I don't want to sing I Can't Get Started, you know, like sort of a straighter mm -hmm. Ella Fitzgerald mm -hmm. thing. If I want to sing I Can't Get Started and quote the solo of Cannonball Adderley's, I mean, when I went up to New York and sat in, the musicians were just like, you know, they, they were very, you know, a little bit more giving and, and helpful instead of, and nothing against the years that I did sing All of Me and really felt like singing it, <laughs> but it's just that it, it, it just, you just sort of have to go with it too. You have to compromise because if you're not singing like a musician, then it's more of a lyrical feeling thing. It isn't as much as in the, in the changes because that's particularly what what makes jazz jazz. It isn't, it isn't singing R&B licks and really feeling the lyric over the standard. And I think a lot of vocalists in, these, in this area, and for me, I'm guilty of it for years, was just like, you know, ah, uh, you know, and it was like, <laughs> you know, it wasn't cutting it. And, and I think a lot of times you have to really take what they're saying to you and you have to work hard at it. And that's, that's the one thing. I don't really have that much hostility except if I'm trying to do something and it's not there, and they'll say, you know, it ain't there. You know, that's really what I noticed. Well, I made a point last night that the singers on the festival, I tried to, to use uh, specific singers uh, uh, who uh, were a part of the band, who, who think themselves that they are part of the band. I mean, I don't say uh, you should do this, but I picked people who already, I feel, are doing that because I wanted to use them as an example to others uh, that this is one approach, not the only approach. This is one approach to uh, being able, uh, being a part of, of, of the ensemble as opposed to now the band plays, now the singer sings. Now the band plays, now the singer sings. Right. You know? <laughs> and so uh, the, 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 uh, uh, what, was doing, what, what was happening last night in, in, uh, with uh, uh, Straight Ahead, you could see the integration of, of the singer, singing backgrounds, mm -hmm. doing, doing all kinds of things. Uh, as an instrument, when she had a, a chance to do her thing, she did her thing as the flute player did or the piano player. You know, so uh, this 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 is just uh, what we're trying to do is is to uh, not cover all bases, but certainly give some indication of some of the things that we think are uh, uh, very much on the cutting edge of, of what's going on, and people who are doing have to be female. Yes. I'd like to go back a, a second. Um, Discussion that you were having about uh, somebody mentioned uh, jazz journalists. There is a jazz journalist association. Uh, Howard Mandel in New York is the pr current president. Willard Jenkins is a vice president. Neither one of them are here. Willard's in New Orleans <laughs> this this weekend. But um, um, 
that's an easy way. There, the, there's, there are at least 100 members internationally. There are overseas members as well. And uh, you mentioned also um, about getting CD reviews or somehow getting your name in print. Um, as a writer, I have to interest my editor. I have to have a hook. So if your CD is two years old, you have to have something new and fresh. You have to be doing something interesting. And I all suggest, I suggest you all come to the panel tomorrow on publicity because, because I think we'll all have some good pointers about how to, get, how to get your name out there. But I mean, I'm always making myself available to jazz musicians all around the country um, to, to, get their, to help them get their name in print, to, to guide them to, to um, getting publicity for themselves. Because, and women in particular have, have a more difficult time because many of the editors of the papers, the entertainment editors, are male. And, uh, and also because in many cases, the entertainment editors don't know anything about jazz. Uh, so, uh. Well, uh, <laughs> just, just on that point, though, now, I do CBS Sunday morning. And uh, most of my producers are female. My executive is, fema uh, 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 is a female. I have a lot of trouble getting certain women on that program. So it's not, it's not gender, it's not gender, it's, it's not gender bias. It, 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 uh, in many cases, it, it, it has to do with the nature of the show, what, what, the, what the executive in the show perceives as, as this is more important than that. Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, I had a, a, a piece that I wanted to do on a particular singer, and I won't call names on it, but uh, on a particular singer, uh, and it was, it was bump. Or uh, in terms of my getting a crew and doing it at that particular time, uh, uh, because uh, the people who were making the decision as to what was going on the air uh, uh, said, "Well, this is uh, this is about a guy who um, has a, a more dramatic problem. He's got a problem with his hands and and so forth. He has to soak them and, and so 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 that uh, that was uh, really uh, that aired last Sunday. I mean, or a couple of Sundays." And it was, it was, it's a good piece. I mean, I, you know, it was a piece that I wanted to air because it, 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 it showed how devoted a particular jazz musician was to playing. Uh, he, he has to soak it. He can only play five minutes at a time. I mean, it's, it's a very dramatic story. But my point is, that, okay, why should that cancel the other one? I mean, I, you know, don't, don't you know, just put it on, on hold, but don't cancel it, you know. And, and so now I've got to go do some other changes to get the, the one that I was working on back on track, you know. That, that's the point, and I'm sure you run into the same thing in print. I have to give my editor a, a background on the person, why I think they're important. I mean, it's, it's selling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's basically selling. So if yeah. I have to do that to my editor, you have to do that to me yeah. so, that I, so that I can. So you have something to work with. So, mm -hmm. I can, I mean, and so that's the way you know, journalists can help the musicians, but you have to help us too. I got a magazine in, in, the, uh, in the mail last week. Uh, I'm sure everybody in here knows it, but I don't know where this tape is going, so I won't call any names. But it <laughs> says right on the front, right on the front cover, over 170 CDs reviewed. And then I have seen I that, that I, 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 about three months ago, I, it said over 140 reviewed. Another month said over 150 reviewed. If that, you know, you know what I'm saying? How many? Now that's one magazine. I'm in the publishing business. I get at least 10 periodic periodicals a week coming in there. At one time, I used to take out a day to read. Now I have to take out three days a week to read. With all of these reviews, with all these records, can you tell me if that serves the product, or does it serve the artist, or, or who reads the reviews, or how does someone reading or the consumers know what to go buy, or just what, I mean, because that, to me, 170 records in a month seems to be a lot of product, and that's just that one, one uh, uh, publication. My name is Linda Bramble, and I do jazz publicity. Um, clearly, there is a glut in the marketplace. There is so much product out there. You know, every month, it raises another 10,000 reviewed. It's impossible for everybody to absorb all of, all of these things. And I think to answer your question, that if you get a CD reviewed, if you get one hit, that's great. If you get two hits, that's even better. It's a cumulative effect. What do you mean by hit? A review, oh, a okay. single mention, okay. whether it's on the radio, 
or in a review in a magazine or in a newspaper, whatever mention it is. Um, I think that it's very hard on all of us today because it's, we're in a different time. The technology has made it such that anyone can have a CD. I mean, we could walk out here and, and go down the street and in an hour we could have a CD pressed and ready to take home. It's, it's not like it used to be, and so Billy's right. We have to deal with what is and find a way to get around these obstacles instead of whining about them. Everybody is putting out CDs. In one year, I get over 300 CDs to review, and I mean, I can't even keep up with, with what comes across my desk because in the meantime, I'm also writing you know, feature articles for magazines and so forth. So my, my suggestion to people is if you're, going, if you're going to put out a CD, really be prepared to back it up. You need, you need first of all, to have a good, a good background regionally. I mean, you know, to some exposure re regionally. And then you have to be prepared after you release that CD within a year to release another one because you're going to be forgotten. So so fast, unless you're, unless you're, you're really keeping your name out there, it's it's a struggle. I I don't know how how some of you do it. Marion can probably attest to this too. I mean, as journalists, we we have a difficult time keeping up with everything that's coming out. And in some cases, for example, I review for Jazz Times. They'll they'll send me five CDs. I don't even I don't get to pick from my stock. <laughs> You know, I, I am, you know, basically the, the CDs are screened by the editors and then uh, sent to the reviewers. So, you know, un unless you've got, I mean, unless you're, I mean, don't even waste the money and the time unless your music is absolutely <laughs> superb because it's an expensive thing. And, and most people think, what I got to do is release a CD. My suggestion is to just, like, think about it real hard and be prepared to to back well, it up. Uh, the idea of the glut on the market that, that uh, 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 Andrew White mentions is real. I mean, you're going to have, that's your competition. If there are 170 this week, 180 next week, Ooh. and all that, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's what, you know, okay, if you got that many, where do women fit in? You know, that, that's the real. So you really have to, to, to think uh, about uh, uh, what positive steps, in my self interest, I mean, it, what, what can I do with, 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 with my group to put me out there so, so that next year, uh, Kennington Center will come on down, you know, you know, what, you know what, do you, what do you do? You, you have to be, as, as Carol said, you have to be aggressive, you have to really be uh, uh, creative. As creative as you are in your artistry, you're going to have to be that way about your careers and your collective uh, association, inter uh, actoring and, 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 and uh, really networking with the, it's an over word, overused word, but certainly that, that's the answer to some of the, to the problems. So I'd like to thank all of the, the, the members of the panel. Thank you.